All right, quick look at the market action this morning, and there is really one story or one theme that is disappointing us today. You're taking a look at here at Meta, uh, that sharp plunge that we saw in the stock after hours. Meta, of course, uh, putting out its earnings report. Uh, two things that really stood out. Firstly, you've got that weaker sales guidance for the current quarter coming through, and secondly, also higher capex spending. What investors are really concerned about is this was the company that was considered one of the leaders in the AI race, not really seeing anything in terms of ROI. So big plunge that we're seeing as well for those tech companies that are still due to report their earnings, but weakness ahead of that for the likes of Alphabet, Microsoft. In the session today, how that's playing out, big translation into Asia so far. Uh, SK Hynix, for instance, we had its earnings out uh, earlier today. And SK Hynix, if you just take a look at that move, but essentially uh, showing a drop here and uh, the, the, the move really being attributed to the, 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 the meta story as well. Uh, Taiwan just coming online, you can see already a drop of 1%. The Nikkei trading down 1.3%. Uh, not just a story in terms of equities, there's also that focus on currencies today. The Japanese yen just weakening to a fresh 34-year low against the greenback this morning, but also taking a look at what we see uh, for the Japanese yen. If you bring up the terminal chart versus one of its biggest trading pairs, and that's, of course, the, the Chinese yuan. Here again, you're seeing the yuan versus the Japanese yen, Dave, reaching a record high. Yeah, you, you could really make the argument that intervention risk, to your point there, Bill, is, is certainly a lot more heightened today, given the fact that the yen has weakened amidst really, up until right now, has been a story of dollar weakness broadly against peers so far this week. So incremental weakness coming through there. Um, on that very note, so a couple of things that Bell pointing out here going into the agenda today. So this world-beating equity market rally that's taking place in Hong Kong might be at risk given the dawn draft we are seeing across uh, global equity markets as we speak. Dollar China on your screen, 727 is the handle on the offshore rate. Uh, we'll talk more about Anthony Blinken in China in just a moment and really where the conversations are around that. There's a Beijing auto show and along those lines there's a press briefing this hour from Xiaomi on the SU7 in about 20 minutes or so. We'll bring in the latest of that. Earnings, big as well. Uh, a couple of big names on your screens. And, of course, the big drop in CGBC yesterday on the back of that warning coming out, or the guidance coming out, to be more specific there, from officials that maybe, just maybe, this rally might be slightly more divorced from the economic reality. Anyway, lots of watch on deck today. We're about 27 minutes from the opening bell. Bell. Yeah, of there course. We go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a cue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, geopolitical risks, of course, are, are front and centre here today, and, and tensions between the U.S. and China, because you've got, as you were saying, Secretary of State Antony Blinken set to meet with senior Chinese officials in Shanghai today, and that's before he heads to Beijing for a, a possible meeting with President Xi Jinping. And our news desk editor Jill Desis is with us. And Jill, there are just so many different contentious talking points for them to, to pass over together. Yes, uh, there really are. I think at this point what Blinken's probably focused on is uh, some of these issues of industrial capacity that the West has been concerned about. We heard Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen uh, sort of hammer China on that when she was just in Beijing a couple of weeks ago talking about these, these issues of economic imbalance across the world caused by uh, cheap uh, Chinese goods um, being exported elsewhere. Of course, uh, China's hit back on some of those allegations. I think the other thing, too, that we've really got to hone in on is um, any concerns that the U.S. has about uh, what kind of ch uh, trade China is doing with Russia and how that's ultimately bolstering Russia's defense effort. We've also seen, in light of Yellen's visit just recently, uh, that um, you know the, the U.S. is perhaps mulling additional sanctions on Chinese banks that maybe um, they, 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 they think are aiding Russia. So I think these are really kind of these top-of-mind issues for Blinken as he meets in Shanghai with Communist Party officials. As you said, he might be meeting with Xi Jinping himself in Beijing tomorrow. I think all of that's really on his radar. And of course, all of this happening just as the U.S. has signed into law this, uh, this p possible ban or divestment uh, you know, legislation concerning TikTok. What options do you think China has right now uh, as it pertains to the TikTok story? Well, there are a couple, David. So ultimately, look, um, I guess the China regulators have to approve this deal if it ends up um, if it ends up being the case that ByteDance does want to go ahead and divest. Remember, uh, what this legislation does is give uh, ByteDance and TikTok 270 days to decide: Do you want to pull out of the U.S. market entirely, or do you want to try divesting and giving it to you know another another company? So uh, Chinese regulators, of course, would have to approve any deal that goes through on that on that um, effort. Uh, the other thing too 
too, is that um, there could be some kind of a tit-for-tat uh, measure. Um, perhaps it's that Beijing could try to retaliate with, um, you know, blocking, you know, some American tech firms in right. China. Of course, there's not too many that really operate there anymore. Yeah, th that's a point. I think, can we go back to the live shots as well? I think we're just, in fact, right now speaking of Antony Blinken. He's in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. He's meeting with the party secretary there, Chen, Chen Juning, uh, ahead, of course, of a possible meeting uh, with Xi Jinping. Um, more on, if you could talk more, because Meta is a big story today, and certainly the options on the table if China were to respond via the route of targeting, I'm loosely using that conceptually, of course, the word targeting, U U.S. tech firms, not a lot of them on social media in China anyway. So that presence has really scaled back. Exactly. I mean, we've really seen that over the past several years. In particular, I mean, Meta does not have a major presence in China to that effect. Um, we saw, um, you know, LinkedIn recently pulled out all of its operations out of China. That was, you know, my, Microsoft was notably, notably one of the only ones with really, uh, you know, kind of a social media presence. Um, you have essentially, because of the great uh, Chinese uh, firewall, um, really very limited access to a lot of the type of social media apps that you might otherwise think, um, you know, would, would be operational within China. So yes, I think in terms of that level of retaliation, maybe not a whole lot that China can do. And we've also just seen in general so far, the response has been fairly muted toward this legislation anyway. Um, and, and so we'll have to see how that develops, you know, particularly during, during an election year. Remember, um, Donald Trump has said that if he's elected, he would try to, you know, he actually is not really in favor of this legislation. So mm -hmm. I think a lot's still up in the air um, before the end of the year. Yeah, and just recapping, of course, you're taking a look at those live pitches there, Blinken, meeting with the Shanghai Party Secretary. But in the course of these discussions, and especially as we head into a key election year as well, we probably can't expect too much in the way of deliverables, anything concrete out of this, do you think? No, probably not. I mean, we kind of saw this uh, sort of similar dynamic play out when Yellen was just visiting recently as well. I mean, how much is there really going to be, um, you know, in this U.S.-China relationship? I think at this point, particularly when, you know, you rewind about, you know, 18 months ago, two years, you know, or so, um, you were really dealing with a lot of really heightened tensions between the U.S. and China. Remember that, I mean, you know, Blinken was supposed to visit back in, you know, early 2022, that visit was derailed by a spy balloon. They've just um, been able to get back to this point where the U.S. and China are just able to talk and there's actually, you know, officials that are going into China. So I think stability within the relationship, at least from the China side, is really what you kind of want to manage here, particularly because, as we've been talking about, we're going into a U.S. election year where not, you know, I mean, Joe Biden obviously has been very tough on China through these, these sanctions and such. Trump has also pledged to be, you know, somewhat tough on China as well. I mean, he's floated the idea of 60 percent uh, mm. The tariffs on Chinese goods. So there's a lot still at stake here as we get into November in particular. There we go. Jill, thank you so much. Jill Deese is there. Uh, a closer look at the market action right now. So three big themes, of course, meta and the meta story, 15% down in pre-markets, dollar yen, 155 for the first time since uh, June 1990. And this world-beating rally that's taking place in Hong Kong might be at risk given the downdraft in equity markets. Let's bring in Mark Cranfield. Uh, with our M Live team, of course, he's with us out of Singapore. Mark, why don't you get us started amongst the three that I mentioned or other things? What's top of mind for you? Um, well, the the meta one is uh, is interesting uh, because the, the looks as though the thing that investors really didn't like about it was that Mr. Zuckerberg was warning that he needs to spend more money on AI development to to really get Meta into the right place, and that got the stock slammed in after hours trading. Well, if that's the case, that's a horrible warning signal for the other big um, Magnificent Seven so-called stocks, which are coming up with their reporting this week and into, into next month as well. Because if investors don't want you to spend even more on AI, they just want to see the benefits straight away. There is so much priced in to these big tech stocks in terms of the promise of AI. It really is going to be an issue for them. So they've all got to spend money to get there. And the investors just want to get the payback straight away. It's, the, the two can't happen. So what happened to Meta is a very big warning signal for what may happen to some of the other big names who are reporting in the next few days. Yeah, and actually, Mark, when you take a look at the moves that we've seen in After Hours, it has been a big drop anyway already for those companies that are reporting Alphabet, for instance. Uh, Microsoft, another one that we're seeing the weakness spreading SK Hynix despite its better numbers. How do you think that plays into the story for China stocks? Because, uh, of course, uh, we've seen that move coming through for, for some of the, the Chinese tech names. Do you think that translates across? Or do you think, given the differences in the AI approaches of China and the US, it's sort of... it's own idiot, it's syncretic story. 
Well, there, there might be some relief, particularly for the, for the Chinese tech names. What we've seen this week, a lot of the drivers of, of what's moving the Chinese names this week have been the, about games. Um, the Tencent especially is going to have some, some new games coming earlier than expected, and they can generate a lot of revenue from that. So that game sector is somewhat different to the AI space. Now, it doesn't mean to say that the Chinese tech names are going to be immune to any spillover that you get in a negative way from the, the United States or even from the, the Korean tech stocks. But the fact that investors are very focused on the new revenues that could come from as increased uh, games go into the Chinese onshore market, that's obviously something which may insulate them to some extent. Doesn't mean to say that they, they will necessarily outperform all the time, but it does give them the cushion that it's not just an AI story. There's may, more going on than that. So let's see what investors do with it. It's not, it's not impossible to think that you might get um, a small up move in the Chinese tech names, even with the US names going downwards. Yeah, and we're already up 9% on that gauge here in Hong Kong this week. Mark, just uh, two, uh, two words for you. You can fill the awkward silence after this. <laughs> Dollar yen. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people talk going around that the Japanese authorities would be very reluctant to step in before the conclusion of the Bank of Japan meeting. Now, it, that, you, you can see why that is playing out, because Governor Ueda has talked more about the yen than his predecessor. He clearly puts the yen at the center of monetary policy because of the inflationary impact. So as the yen gets weaker, it feeds into his story that inflation is going to stay higher for longer. It will feed through to Japanese wages. That gives him the, the reasons for tightening Japanese policy further in the months ahead. Knowing that, and knowing that there's the US dollar is generally very strong, you can see why they might be reluctant to intervene until they hear what the Bank of Japan is going to do. Yeah, we'll find out tomorrow. There we go. Mark, thank you. Mark Cranfield in Singapore for us. Just ahead here in shows, we'll be taking straight to Beijing and the auto show taking place there. And our colleague, of course, Stephen Engel, is on the ground for us. We're talking all things EVs with GWM's Parker Shirt. Yeah, and one to watch, of course, after the earnings yesterday. Yeah. But first, uh, the UBS analyst who called out Evergrande has turned bu bullish on property. We'll be finding out why. And actually, that story is one of the most read on the terminals so far this morning. Uh, counting down, of course, to the opens of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. This is The China Show. Welcome back to shows. 14 minutes of the opening bell. We're just getting the RMB reference rate of the day on shore. We're looking at 710.58, just about where we have been for the better part of the last, what, four or five days or so. It's really about dollar strength coming back, given the risk aversion out there. It's also about dollar, dollar yen, which we can talk about a bit later on. Let's turn our attention, though, to Chinese property. Yeah, well, it's interesting because we had that eco survey out earlier saying that property actually is still one of the biggest risks for, mm. for the economists that we survey. But our next guest actually made headlines three years ago when he put a sell rating on Evergrande, and that was 11 months before the developer defaulted. But now he's turning bullish on China's property sector. John Lam is head of China and Hong Kong Property Research at UBS Investment Bank and John you're going against the grain once again here because as I said that you know there's a lot of people that we speak to that would probably disagree with you so uh, why uh, why are you saying this and why are you forecasting a recovery here uh, sure so I think there are a few reasons uh, the number one is about the uh, supply side uh, the construction new start has been falling uh, three years in a row uh, so the sector has been destocking uh, the second one is about the central government also launched the three uh, major projects uh, one of which is about the urban village renovation uh, and the central bank also prints about um, 500 billion uh, PSL to support uh, this program and I, guess, and I guess the third reason is about uh, over the past three years, we had been um, uh, troubled by the multiple developers' default. Uh, but so far, it seems that the government also is trying to support uh, the developers in terms of the financing uh, to stop the uh, vicious cycle. Right. Um, what do you think are the most, or if you had to single one out, what's the single most important leading indicator? 
for the property sector right now? I would say it would be the uh, tier one cities, um, okay. in particular Beijing, Shanghai, the property price, mm. uh, secondary property price, uh, and a leading indicator to that would be about the secondary listing, mm. uh, the supply from the secondary market in the tier one cities. Right, and what are those telling you? So after the uh, Chinese New Year, the secondary listing uh, continue to uh, increase, mm. uh, so which is not a good sign. Um, I guess one of the reasons is because the property price uh, continue to decline, and that makes people feel that uh, property price may probably f decline furthermore. What makes you so confident in the speed of the recovery? Because you look at other examples, uh, Japan, for instance, took about 15 years to, to recover from its property bust. The US, for instance, about six following the subprime uh, mortgage crisis. Why do you think it can be done in such a short amount of time? I think um, the, um, uh, there are two reasons for that. Number one is that uh, the, uh, the shrinkage of the volume uh, is sharper compared to uh, the other two countries. Uh, mainly it's about the supply of decreasing, which is the construction uh, new starts. Uh, and I guess the second reason is because China is still uh, a developing country, which means that the urbanization rate is still going on. Uh, the underlying uh, demand is uh, better than the uh, developed countries. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, right now we are in the, probably in the middle stage of the urbanization uh, stage. So the underlying demand is still there. But just the fact that people are delaying their property purchase uh, because of the uh, uncertainty on the property price outlook. Mm -hmm. What, what progress are we seeing on the, and one of the issues was people were doubting and had doubts over whether some of the projects would get completed. And I'm wondering, since you came out with this report, this was back in January, have we seen a substantial progress in terms of the completion of some of these unfinished construction projects? Uh, sure. So uh, a few um, uh, update here. The first one is about the central government also come up with the project white list yep. uh, in the middle of June. Um, we also put a report on the, on the back of that. Um, so that one is uh, moving on. Um, but I guess more have to be done. Uh, and then the second thing is um, back to about two years, roughly about two years ago, the central government also come up with the project completion fund. Um, so I think the progress has been moving on, but probably more need to be done uh, to restore the completion. So what, what would need to be done exactly? What would encourage that, do you think? Uh, simply to terms is more money, uh, more funding support. Mm. Uh, we estimate the, uh, uh, the suspended or delayed project is roughly about 7 million units uh, back in the report that we published in March. Um, and the required funding is roughly about 2 trillion. Uh, so far, the funding coming from the government is probably um, uh, not enough to meet with the two trillion funding needs. Everyone has a different level of conviction in the things that they say. So how confident are you in the projection that you're making? Um, I think the thing is more about the, um, uh, the difference between the uh, outlook and also the confidence compared to the investor. So when I talk to the investors, they are very negative. Uh, and and um, based on my about 15 years of uh, sales experience, when people are very, very negative, uh, even though the, the fundamental is getting worse, share price may not react uh, negatively. But it's actually is the opposite. So what I see on the equity side is about the risk reward here. A tiny surprise on the fundamentals would probably need uh, investors to uh, reposition their, their position. Right. And what... What criteria, I know you can't talk specific stocks, but I'm just wondering what criteria you're using to filter the possible winners from the losers. Is it a price to book? Are you looking at valuation measures? Are you looking at exposure to specific, you know, tier one city exposure? Are you looking at state backed developers, for example? Uh, sure. So a few things here. Number one is about the land acquisition um, because the land acquisition determined the earnings outlook for three or four years later. Um, and also, land acquisition also indirectly tell investors that whether the company have access to funding, because you have to pay for the land. Um, so usually when the developer slow down the land acquisition, mm. it's not a good sign here. Okay. And then the second one is about the uh, shift of the business model. Um, so I also prefer the company with commercial property exposure uh, which allow them to change the business model. Uh, more earnings were coming from the rental income. 
Um, and uh, I think we have an example, something like the uh, Hong Kong company. They also have this kind of a feature as well. Okay. John, we could, it feels like chapter one's barely done. <laughs> Let's do this again next time. Uh, fantastic there. Uh, John Lam, their head of China and Hong Kong property research at UBS Investment Bank. Okay, um, since time, big move up yesterday, 38%, then was suspended and halted in trading. Company had to come out and basically say they were unaware of certain uh, uh, announcements that made the stock go up. And then we're resuming trade today and we're up a further 18% in your pre-markets. I would imagine this is adding to your price action today, maybe counter to the downdraft we're seeing across these equity markets. We're trading at 17,144, slightly lower on the Hang Seng Index. A full preview of your trading day ahead. You're watching The China Show. We're headed into a softer open today on your screen shortly. Uh, not as bad as really what we're seeing across some other markets uh, coming online. We're down 1%, for example, in uh, some benchmarks across the region. Might be down to the fact that you are getting some buying coming through. In fact, sense time, we'll, Annabelle will talk about that in a moment, coming in a little bit as well. So that's really boosting some of the volumes. That's the reason why volumes actually spiked yesterday. Might we'll see a continuation of this world beating rally here, Bill. Yeah, big question, of course, what earnings signals to us as well, because a few different themes coming through. You've seen that big drop there for new oriental education. Uh, fourth quarter net revenue coming in at or seeing it at 1.1 billion to 1.13 but a uh, sense time another one standing out of course as you said it's that AI play we saw a huge jump in the stock yesterday up nearly 40 percent looks to be extending an ASMPT a chip link name uh, meta of course that's the other AI theme today really disappointing investors Welcome back. You're watching The China Show and taking us straight to some live pictures here from Beijing. You're seeing a picture here of the Xiaomi chairman, Lei Jun, giving a briefing, talking about the numbers that have come through for their new EV, the SU7 that was launched in March. This is a really key theme at the Beijing Auto Show this year, given you're seeing these new entrants coming into the market. So the likes of Xiaomi, Huawei, for instance, those legacy tech names now moving into the EV space. But the numbers just being announced for their orders, more than 75 thousand have been purchased delivered so far you're just under the six thousand mark so certainly something will be tracking in Xiaomi in focus at the open as well Dave yeah we're looking at that stock it's still amazing really to a lot of people Bell how he's actually standing next to an actual car right how quickly <laughs> they really went from concept to well to car um, here we go uh, at the open we're looking at some declines across your boards right now uh, you're looking at your 30-year yields in focus today after the very big drop that we had on price and futures yesterday. That's doing the opposite right now, following against comments coming through um, out of officials. HS Tech, we'll talk more about this tech rally taking place. We're still above, give or take, 8.5% from last Friday. Um, a lot of that perhaps recently, let's say recently yesterday, is down to sense time. Volumes on that 12-month high as sense time volumes uh, kicked up yesterday. Halted in trade. It's coming back in. Uh, resuming trade today, that's your, one of the stocks we're tracking. And the other three we're tracking here are some of the other big names that have done exceptionally well amid the rally in tech taking place. So I would imagine maybe there's some temptation to take some money off the table as far as sense time is concerned. Flip the boards, please, if we can. Ten-year yield, as you can see, is a strength coming through there in the Chinese currency. Sense time's up 12.5% and some weakness coming through in some of your big tech plays a little bit. Uh, as we speak here, Tencent is down about 1%. It's not really not a lot given the, the move we've seen recently. Right. It's been a big week in terms of trading debuts. So, ah, finally, some green on your <laughs> screens. There we go. So this should be up or down about 30% go with the gains we're seeing today. Debuted yesterday. Did close off lows of the day. Malvoy into the close yesterday and some earnings coming through as well. CNET and also uh, ZTE. So earnings are a key focus as well. Apart from other things, of course, taking place. Bell. 
Yeah, well, Dave, I think it's really interesting when you track some of those moves we've had in the IPO space over the course of this week and those disappointments for us as well. But uh, against the backdrop of that, you've actually seen those big gains coming through. And uh, Hong Kong stocks, they're, they're, if not the top of the world this week, they're at least very close to being the top of the world. So let's get more on that now with our Asia equities reporter, Charlotte Yang, joining us. And Charlotte, uh, how long do you think that this can extend, especially when you're against that more global backdrop of, of earnings weakness that we're seeing feeding through? Yeah, it does feel like you know, sentiment is really bad when now we're seeing, you know, some investors are taking profit or like, you know, rotating from those markets that were quite expensive and doing really well this year and then now coming back to uh, China and Hong Kong stocks. And it- you know, here people have been talking for a very long time it's undervalued but now with earnings all look stabilizing growth looks like we're, we're okay no major negative news coming up and and also with with on the back of man you know the national team has been in this market so there's limited downside um so it looks like you know sentiment could stay for a bit and this time we see with hong kong you're seeing those mega chinese mega caps that are doing really well you know from 10 cent to may 20 which is a different well, earlier where some of the times those rallies were boosted by those more volatile um names that hedge funds like but this time it's more of the favorites of the long only funds have been doing well. Uh, let's talk about the specific, uh, before we talk about the snowball derivatives. So the likes of Tencent have done very well. So what are you guys watching today? specific names? Yeah, I think for, uh, for Tencent, is, we're definitely watching if the, com- uh, the, the stock could hit more um, technical bullish signals. Um, you know, one, one signal traders is watching is whether it's 15 moving day average is going to cross 100 day. That's going to give um, more, you know, upside for the stock. And then today is going to be a very uh, busy earnings results day, which we're watching, you know, yeah. HKEX, uh, this blue chip Hong Kong stock. Um, looks like earnings are quite positive. We're also watching Prada, which is showing some... St- strengths in the uh, Miu Miu cells as well as, but on the negative, uh, the, the, the bad news side, we also New Oriental, uh, the education Chinese company, the ADRs failed the most since October 2020 overnight after the results. So we're seeing, uh, but analysts are saying that's overdone. So watching if Hong Kong list issues will uh, perform better today. And in all of this as well, you've got, you've got these market regulators that are really focused on it. Yeah, of course, they want to see gains, but at a minimum, it's all about stability as well. So we're hearing a Bloomberg scoop, of course, but more limitations around exotic options coming back into play. Yeah, so our scoop from the finance colleagues uh, say, uh, say that the Chinese uh, officials have told some of the nation's biggest brokerages this week that uh, they're going to, uh, they should suspend any increase in the net exposure for those over-the-counter derivative products, including um, snowball products that are based on uh, options, um, and and we, we so far we at this stage we don't know how long those restrictions will last. Um, as the regulators didn't indicate when they will be lifted or eased, but I think this what this shows is that it's up on regulators' mind to stabilize the stock market and reduce um, those excessive risks. But it could be bad for brokerages as they're already engaging in this fierce battle, a pricing competition to reboost investors' appetite for snowball these risky products. And uh, we have an er- er- earlier scoop from finance earlier this week. Saying that some of the brokerages are going as far as having a coupon rate of more than 40% to attract those interests back into these type of products. Charlotte, thank you so much. Charlotte Yang there talking us through this down, this uh, tail, these tailwinds coming through here in Hong Kong. By the way, uh, in case you missed it, so a couple of things to tell you about. 200-day moving average, we crossed that yesterday. We're breaking above that even further uh, right now. 6,100 right now on the Hang Seng China Index. Also being revised higher is this uh, thinking around the Chinese economy. Uh, this year, our latest economic survey, the results are out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, good news, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what, what uh, China watchers want to see, but it's, it's that raise that we're getting in the projections. Mm-hmm. I think the latest reading had been for a 4.6% mm-hmm. forecast. Uh, we're now looking at 4.8%. Mm-hmm. Of course, not quite at Beijing's goal just mm-hmm. yet, but we're definitely getting a bit closer. Yeah, there we go. For our Bloomberg clients, it's ECFC Go on your Bloomberg terminal. It's the latest forecast from private economists. Uh, there we go. Yeah, 4.8%. Okay, we'll take you straight back. Bell mentioned Beijing. We'll take you straight back to Beijing. And the auto show is getting underway. Returning for the first time since 2019. You have domestic, you have global manufacturers revving up for new product launches. And certainly, Stephen Engel, our man on the ground, is there. And how the, the narrative, Steve, around the auto sector has have shifted since 2019. All things EVs, effectively. 
Yeah, I mean, look, China is really pushing heavily into EVs. There's no a question. And we haven't been back here since uh, 2019. And the landscape in the EV space has changed dramatically. Chinese take the top spaces in the uh, top 10 leaderboard, nine out of 10. Tesla, the only outlier there. So clearly in the EV space, the Chinese makers are dominating. Let's get more perspective on that and also their international ambitions. It's Parker Schur. We're here at the Great Wall Motor booth here at the Beijing Auto Show. Parker, you're the head of international and also vice president, obviously, with GWM, Great Wall Motor. You are known to be the big SUV maker. You're also going into smaller, more um, younger focused EVs with the Hao Mao, the funky cat. What is your main strategy as the Chinese players really taking the top spot in this domestic market? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is a good question uh, to answer, to be answered, because, uh, you know, from our side, our strategy is very clear. Net AEV strategy is very clear for Chinese market. You know, I think, uh, you know, we'll push a lot of new energy vehicles, including the BEV, PHEV in the market, so to compete with other, you know, the play players. Of course, in overseas market, uh, we also probably have, uh, we also may have the, some different strategy, com com you know, compared with... What is with, your uh, top strategy? Strategy. You're, you're in charge of kind of branding your company, and you have multiple brands. Yes. You have the Haval SUV, you yeah. have the Aura, you have Way, you have Tank, the big boxy-like SUVs. What's your main strategy for the overseas market? The yeah, overseas strategy is a one GWM strategy. You know, there's one GWM strategy covered all the segments. We have, just like you said, we have the Tank off-road SUV, we have the Havel mainstream SUV, we have the BEV like. A Ola. We also have the Wii brand, the premium, you know, premium brand, you know. So such kind of the, you know, the full power chain and uh, to have different, uh, you know, segment of diversity, diversifications uh, for such kind of the automotive industries uh, to all offer the many products, you know, for the different segment in the overseas market. Because you know the overseas market is uh, quite different, different country, different uh, situations. Uh, so that's why the, we have such a strategy to push, uh, to put the, all of the product, uh, including the different uh, multiple power chains uh, to overseas market. This is our top strategy for overseas market. We know, I mean, it's a, it's a sensitive subject, and I'm not going to necessarily ask you directly about protectionism, but it means that there are further challenges for Chinese car makers to go overseas. How do you differentiate yourself and to sell the cars in overall markets, overseas markets, when there, there potentially could be tariffs and there could potentially be a backlash? Is it a big challenge for you? Uh, of course. For overseas uh, you know, business, uh, you're always the challenge for any OEM players, yeah. uh, no matter Japanese players, yep. Korea players. Uh, and, you know, for Chinese, uh, you know, OEMs, uh, definitely, including the Great Wall Motors, uh, we also have such a different uh, challenge from different, uh, you know, overseas markets. Uh, you know, firstly, let's say the culture. The culture is uh, different, yeah. right? There's the Arabic culture, there's uh, Latin American cultures, you know, different languages, different religions, different, uh, you know, the cultures. Uh, they have the different need, the different demand for the models. Right, so that's why the culture is the different. The culture is the priority challenge, you know, in our overseas market. Secondly, it's talking about uh, like a political system, you know, like uh, you, you know, economic, you know, trade, uh, tariff, or whatever. So we are facing such a kind of, the, you know, that's why the, our strategy is like, uh, you know, we follow the two, you know, uh, uh, actually two corn strategies. So uh, one is the, you know, the uh, locally built. Secondly, secondly, is the locally operated. So you can see that we have a lot of the you know, investment in overseas markets. You know, we also have the, some subsidiaries. You know, in the, our own subsidiary in the different market. That's kind of the you know really understand the market need and also have the you know offer a lot of the jobs to the local the people. You know, to utilize the leverage the local talent and I know how to serve the better for the local. You know, that's why we are following the with the local for the local.
given the market demand and also the challenges, where is going to be your overseas focus in the next few years? Absolutely. Europe or Asia? Where? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, frankly speaking, the Europe is a great market, a good big market. You know, of course, we will aim, aim there. You know, our target will be there. So, you know, of course, for the Asian some, you know, market, you know, we develop this market a long time, many years. You know, we go to the Gulf or go to the Africa, you know, we go to the Latin America. You know, I think that's such kind of market that we have already there. You know, we want to enlarge our market fit share. I know we want to introduce the more new models, uh, you know, for the local, for the local consumers. Uh, this is what we need. Which, which brand is going to give you the most mileage in Europe? Then is it the smaller, the Aura brand, the pure EVs, or is it the big SUVs? I think uh, for the BEV in the European market, uh, you know, it's uh, also booming. You know, of course, uh, that's definitely we have some that. You know, challenge over there. So, you know, the DEV is, uh, you know, those are some other factors also on the go on happening, ongoing. You know, we are, uh, we are confident for our product because we have too many models. We have too many power chains. You know, so we, we, we do have some models or do we have some, the, you know, IC, PHEV, HEV, yeah. you know, to offer you know, our local consumers. Now, here domestically, you're basically partnering up with BMW Mini yeah. to create the, the, the platform for the next generation of Mini EVs. How do you leverage that partnership here domestically abroad with BMW and Mini? <laughs> That's a good question. So we have the partner with the BMW. You know, we uh, share something, you know, supply chain and the platform. And uh, we also build some cars, uh, you know, in the factories, uh, Zhangjiagang factories. You know, definitely we will utilize uh, some uh, know-how or some technology or some platform, you know, to, to overseas market and the uh, Chinese market. Okay, Parker, sure. Good luck to you Thank abroad. You uh, the challenging times for sure, but yeah. lots of opportunities, especially here in this uh, domestic market. Thank you. Have okay. Good day. Thank have you good very day. much, Parker, yeah. sure. Okay. We're kicking off, obviously, a day one coverage of the press day, day one here at the Beijing Auto Show. David, back to you. There we go. Nice to be back on the ground there. Stephen Engel in Beijing Auto Show, resuming after taking a break, effectively, <laughs> uh, since 2019. Right, uh, Great Wall Motor shares up 7% as that conversation was taking place. Dollar yen, I should also point out, wow, there we go, session highs on this. The yen is also falling against every single one of its G10 peers. We're watching this one very, very closely. Yeah, and perhaps nothing really to stop it in its tracks mm -hmm. until it reaches that 160 market as well. So certainly something to watch ahead of the BOJ meeting, of course, uh, later this week. But another stock we're tracking this hour, that shares of Genting, the casino operator here. A little bit weaker, that's the Singapore contract or listing that you're seeing here. What we're hearing about Genting or relates to Genting is that Malaysia's in early discussions with Thai Coons on opening a casino in Forest City. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with Forest City, it's a $100 million uh, development or billion dollar development rather uh, on the coast of the southern coast of Malaysia that's near Singapore. So uh, certainly something that could be positive for Genting, not really being reflected in the share price so far, but likely also to get a little bit of backlash perhaps uh, given uh, Malaysia's a Muslim majority nation and gambling is frowned upon. Okay. Uh, but we will have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. You're watching The China Show, and one of the things we're tracking this morning, of course, is the outlook for equities there, a little bit weaker as we come online. That's really the meta theme that's translating across. But in this part of the world, geopolitics is pretty much always front and centre as well. And a key thing this week is that the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he's in China. We know he's on a mission there to press Beijing on a lot of different thorny issues, and we had those live pitches just earlier. Uh, with Blinken kicking off that trip, one of the headlines crossing so far is that he's saying that there are obliged to, to manage the U.S.-China relationship responsibly. But, of course, big question marks around how that can be done, given the amount of different issues in, in play here. Yeah, it uh, reminds me of the U2 song, With or with, Without You, right? So these two are <laughs> have to manage a very complex relationship, strategic rivals... Um, looking at the future as far as the eye can see, but also, I guess, two of the economies that need each other as much as they do, effectively. Uh, really on the theme that Bell just pointing out, right, geopolitics, we can now draw a direct line between that and really the bottom line and the profits of a lot of these big companies across the world. To talk more about that, 
uh, is Jennifer Welch with us right now, our chief geo economics analyst, of course, joining us out of Washington. Uh, Jennifer, you've written quite a bit about this on, on the terminal, but let me get started by asking you this. What, if anything, can we expect out of the meetings taking place in Shanghai and Beijing, given what Bell just pointing out, a very complex backdrop? Very complex backdrop. Uh, as President Biden was signing earlier today in Washington, this law that includes a divestment order for TikTok and includes a new sanctions authority targeting Iran-China oil trade, his Secretary of State is arriving in China to, as he had put it, try and manage a increasingly complex relationship with Beijing. I think as a result, frankly, expectations for concrete progress out of this trip are relatively low. Instead, what this is really about is three things. First, it's providing an outlet for discussing frustrations, even if they're not going to be resolved. Second, it's providing an opportunity for the U.S. to relay its concerns, for Beijing to relay its concerns, even if, again, it's not going to change the other's behavior, but to try and find opportunities for incremental progress where they can. And then third, from Washington's perspective, this is an opportunity to show the world that the United States, at least, is trying to responsibly manage this relationship. And you mentioned TikTok as well. And now, as you say, that President Biden has signed into law uh, that could force a TikTok basically to, to exit the U.S. Or, or to divest its operations there. Not only does Beijing need to decide how to retaliate, but, but also for any China-affiliated company that's operating in the U.S., something they're going to have to take really mm. seriously as well. Absolutely. I think what this demonstrates is that even if you're a very large brand, even if you're a very popular brand, which TikTok is in the United States, you're not necessarily insulated from these geopolitical risks. We saw Washington lawmakers decide over the last few days a bipartisan coalition come together to support this divestment order. And President Biden, who himself has a campaign account on TikTok, supported as well. Where this goes from here, I think TikTok's likely to take it into court. But I think the broader perspective is that the risks for China-affiliated companies are probably set to intensify, especially between now and November, as lawmakers pay closer attention to national security concerns where there's a China nexus, and frankly, where the political incentives are to look tough towards China. Jennifer, you guys have released or updated your outlook here on, in, in terms of just the geoeconomic risks out there. Take us to the top of that list right now. Sure. So there's a lot of risks to cover, but I'd highlight three. The first one would be in the Middle East. We just exited what seemed to be the most immediately tense situation between Israel and Iran of this tit-for-tat cycle. It looks like we might be slightly out of the woods, but I wouldn't breathe a sigh of relief quite yet. There still remains major room for escalation, for miscalculation, not just between Israel and Iran, but between Israel and Iranian proxies, the region at large. The second thing I'd point to is, understandably, a lot of global attention has been focused on the war in Ukraine and the war in the Middle East. But tensions are rising in the Indo-Pacific as well. Taiwan's new president is going to take office next month. Tensions are rising between China and the U.S. ally, the Philippines and the South China Sea. And North Korea, we can't forget in part because North Korea does not like to be forgotten and will take that opportunity to remind the world that it remains very much a player. So the Indo-Pacific really can't be forgotten even amidst all these other global challenges. And then the third thing I point to is this is a year of elections. There are major votes happening all around the world, each with the potential to bring in a lot of political but also policy changes. But among them, the U.S. election is likely to be especially impactful. We could see major changes that affect the war in Ukraine, affect the war in in the Middle East affect global trade relationships. And so all of those will be votes to watch, but we'll be especially attuned to what's happening in November. That was Jennifer Welch there, Chief Geoeconomics Analyst at Bloomberg Economics. And we'll have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. About 25 minutes into the session so far for mainland Hong Kong equities and lots of different movers so far in the session. But one of those is New Oriental and you're seeing that plunge coming through here. We had the earnings yesterday, a pretty mixed bag of results, but it included a profit miss and also quite a cautious guidance as well on margins. Uh, that is being reflected in the share price. But importantly as well, a lot of the analysts we're speaking to, including Goldman Sachs, are saying this sort of correction, it's actually looking pretty overdone. Uh, let's change on, take a look at some of the other movers 
movers in focus this morning. Uh, these include sense time here. You're seeing that surge coming through for a second straight session. They've unveiled a new AI model, uh, and that is really getting a lot of op investors very excited here. So yesterday soaring nearly 40%, that surge extending so far today. Other ones to note as well, you've got China Overseas Land, those shares rising off the back of first quarter margin improvement. Uh, Sinopec Shanghai as well, a little bit firmer here, but net income coming in at 84.1 million yuan. And then Great Wall Motors, of course, we actually just had the interview there with Great Wall, but uh, better numbers coming through as well. Earnings beat, export growth, it's all being eyed among amid very intense EV competition in China. Okay, yeah, and that's all taking place against this uh, generally a risk off session across the region here, including what we're seeing on a CSI 300 down three tenths at one percent. Encouragingly so, the Hang Seng Index is holding up. We're flat against the backdrop of global macro movers for you very quickly. A one percent drop across equity markets in the region. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The China Show. And here's a look at how tech stocks are faring so far in Hong Kong, half an hour into the session. I mean, it's not much of a surprise you're seeing a drop there today because actually when you take a look broadly across Asian equities, there's a clear, clear theme that's really developing, and that is the big drop that you're seeing in tech stocks off the back of Meta, Dave. Yeah, 15%. And, you know, I think that's a good example of SK Hynix, right, as you were mentioning earlier on. Really good set of earnings. Really good set. You know, in on all caps, you know, biggest uh, biggest pop in sales going back in, in since 13 years. But all that being said, it's really taking place against that specific backdrop of, I mean, throwaway investing 101, right? Um, you have Tesla yesterday missing estimates, up 10% in your pre-markets. Meta coming in with a decent set of numbers, down 15%. Anyway, of course, that's fairly more nuanced. Uh, no one's narrative there. All that being said, looking at the sort of uh, indicators right now because of Meta, that's happening. 1.2%. SK Hynix, we talked about that. That's happening amidst, again, the, the, the biggest pop in growth uh, uh, in, in, since 2010 as far as the top line is concerned. 30-year yields continuing to uh, come under pressure right now on the back, I guess, of some commentary coming through out of Chinese officials right now. You had a record drop on 30-year futures yesterday. Watch it very closely. And check out where dollar yen is, right? So look at that and look at this next graphic that's about to come up on your screen. So we're 24 hours, give or take, from the BOJ meeting. Um, and check out overnight fall. Expect it here on dollar yen. Uh, was it the highest going back to the March 19 meeting of the BOJ a few minutes back? But as we enter the sort of 24-hour event horizon going into that BOJ meeting, that's now at the highest level going back to December of last year. So we're on watch for that. Could be a big nothing burger. Could be completely different. Very quickly, Asia X China looking like this. We're down 1% on the benchmark. We're looking at losses across most of the, most of the benchmarks and most of the markets that are trading uh, right now, including Japan, including Singapore. Taiwan's also coming under a bit of pressure right now. Dollar strength is coming back to a lesser extent uh, today. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a fairly busy day. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. And we'll, by the way, we'll give you guys a preview of some of the key data coming through. Can we change this up, please, if we can? Uh, key data coming through out of the U.S. later today. Initial jobless claims, GDP, and also PCE. Uh, PC. There we go. As we point out, risk off session. Bell. Yeah, absolutely. And as we said, it, I, I think it's still that big story of tech that's mm. feeding through and, and, and the meta earnings and what that's signaling, given the amount of optimism we've had from investors around AI, but uh, so far really not building into any sort of ROI. But let's bring in Bloomberg's M Life strategist, Mark Cranfield. And Mark, what's standing out to you so far in the session? Well, as you say, you're talking about the uh, earnings and expectations and how people are, are disappointed or not. And it, it, just a reminder that so much of the equity world at the moment is about people's view of what's happening in the, the months ahead rather than what may have happened in the, in the previous months. So the interpretation from Tesla was that they expect a very positive period to come and they were rewarded for it. And then Meta is cautious on the, on the period ahead and they get slammed for it. So we, when you've got the other big Magnificent Seven stocks to, to come today and for the next um, few days, you can see why the market is very jittery. There's certainly a reason why the, the Chinese stocks may find their footing a little bit quicker than the American ones, because obviously 
a lot of the story there is about gaming. The, the, a lot of the moves we've seen this week for Tencent, for NetEase, have been driven by the promise of new games and, and bigger distribution in China. So that may give them a cushion against the AI story which is dominating the American name. So certainly it's going to be a very bumpy road and you can see you get dealt with very harshly. If you don't give very confident predictions of what's coming ahead, the investors have got no patience for you whatsoever. So be careful what you say and that, will, that probably is a message that is going to be registered with Microsoft and Alphabet who are the next two big names to come up. Yeah, Mark, and a lot on the sell side this week have come out in, in favor of, of, of Chinese equities, whether that's Hong Kong or onshore, onshore in the case of Goldman. Uh, offshore, of course, UBS came out and uh, effectively uh, raised China to overweight. Uh, is this, speaking of China, is this the mean reversion finally that we've been waiting for for two years, Mark? <laughs> I think um, we've attempted that one so many times. I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be confident to say now is the is the time. But but certainly things are looking more promising, and you, I think there's a reasonable case to be to be said that we've probably seen the worst for Greater China equity or well, onshore China and Hong Kong equities for now. We've, we've probably that's fully priced in. How much they can they can gain on the upside obviously depends on a, a whole slew of factors. But certainly. Um, people are, are much more optimistic from that point of view, but they will want to know that the Chinese authorities are not concentrating on a small group of companies. They want to see the support they're given broad and further across the onshore market. They'll also want to see resilience in some of these Hong Kong names who are being bought partly on valuation because they're just so underpriced compared to their onshore peers. But you need more than that. You need to see the earnings deliverables as well. Otherwise, the, the rally will soon peter out. So it looks promising for now, um, but people will be watching in the next few weeks very carefully to see where we go. Yeah, and what else people are watching very closely, of course, Mark, is, is what's happening with the Japanese yen. And on alert, of course, for any signals of intervention, any jawboning. And mm. it, look, to note, just more of the same, really, we're hearing from the finance minister, Suzuki, right now, saying that they're going to take appropriate action. Mm. Uh, they can't really say too much on FX at this <laughs> point. But <laughs> what are you expecting following the BOJ decision tomorrow? Could we see it reaching closer to that 160 mark? Is there anything they can really do right now to stem the well, there's a couple of things here, and, and it certainly it adds to the case of why just before the weekend may well be the time for some foreign exchange intervention. Our colleague Simon Flint has written this week about it is not unprecedented for the Japanese authorities to intervene on the same day as a Bank of Japan meeting. Obviously, the fact that dollar yen, the speed of the move is starting to get a little bit swifter. It's not just dollar yen. If you look at some of the big crosses, Aussie yen and euro yen have also been moving up pretty fast as well. The, the chief guy at the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Kanda, he said in February that he was concerned when dollar yen moved by 10 big figures in a relatively short time. He said that in February, dollar yen promptly went down. If it went down to about 146, that means that 156, or just around about that area, would be the next 10 yen. We're not far away from it now. So we're in all the thresholds where it's very much on the radar, and Japanese Golden Week holidays begin next week. So Monday is a holiday, and there's a few more holidays coming up after that. So from the point of view of the Japanese authorities, in order to maximize the benefit of supporting the yen tomorrow certainly looks like an ideal time to do it. Whether or not they feel exactly the same, but certainly if they tick off all their boxes, there's a very strong reason why they might want to go just before the weekend and after the Bank of Japan meeting. Mark, just a, a quick word on, interestingly, we haven't even gotten to U.S. inflation and you know, some data coming through in the U.S. tonight. PCE, GDP, initial jobless claims. How, how, where does it rank in terms of the risks to watch today? Oh, well, PCE definitely is huge because the, the Federal Reserve mm. pinned their hopes on lower inflation and lowering rates on that back in December. They were talking very optimistically that that was moving towards their target. Since then, it's gone the wrong way. So it's very much a factor for the Fed, who meet next week, of course. So we should be watching that very closely. All right, Mark. Thank you. Mark Ranfield there in Singapore for us. As we were just pointing out there, Mark saying, okay, core PC, that's certainly one to watch given mm. the repricing that's taking place in 
in the bond markets on inflation and rate cuts or the absence of rate yeah, cuts. Yeah, that's right. But actually, uh, what our Bloomberg Economics team is saying that the core reading for PCE could look to be a little bit less alarming than, mm. than what came through in the, the hot CPI tr print that, that did trigger the sell-off that we had. So uh, they're actually estimating that it's going to register just a modest 0.25% gain there. So that would be matching their forecast as well from a month ago. But certainly, uh, yeah, something tracking very closely what it means for the Fed and, and, and the outlook for, for Fed rate cuts because of course we're getting back down to even zero possibly this year. Yeah, um, looks familiar, doesn't it? Two and a half percent, that's a forecast for GDP, just in case you're curious. Right, um, uh, to look at markets right now, we're looking at this, wow, this reversal, quite a strong one. Mm. HS Tech, uh, we l were lower, gap lower at the open, and since that point in time, there you go, we're up now half of one percent though. Yeah, we'll take a look at sense time. I mean, it's that, that big jump you're seeing for a second straight session. And on a day where you've got meta concerns around its AI, ROI, mm. uh, sense time with its new AI models, certainly impressing investors. Well, the consulting industry has been navigating a slowdown in client activity globally, public scrutiny, economic headwinds. They're further adding to the pressure against a pretty interesting backdrop as well in markets because you're seeing here pretty mixed moves so far in the session, about 90 minutes or, or just under uh, underway for Hong Kong. Tech stocks just seeing a bit of a rebound. But let's discuss, of course, all of this with Joe Nye. He's McKinsey and Company, Greater China Chairman and Senior Partner. And Joe... We're really starting to see perhaps there's some signals of, of, a, of a bottoming in the Chinese economy. January, February was better. March, a little bit weaker. So it's that question mark of whether we're seeing a trend developing or whether that was just sort of a one-off blip. But uh, you, of course, speak to a lot of different executives, meet with a lot of different businesses and companies. What are you seeing on the ground right now? I call 2024 a transition year for China. I think, you know, people came out of COVID with expectations that weren't met. Uh, I think there was a lot of pessimism and lack of confidence in the past quite 24 months. Mm. I think people are now coming to the reality that, look, this is what we're going to see. Let's get on with it. And I think this year is transition. People are transitioning from, you know, uh, medium growth expectations. People are transitioning from how do we deal with this supply and demand. Mm. And uh, what I'm seeing is that there's a growing um, get on with it mentality among all the CEOs. And let's accept this as you know, the new normal in China, mm. and, uh, but we have to deal with it. I think that's a little bit where I'm seeing people. Right. And so what's changed, do you think? And, you know, when I ask you that question, what's changed from 10 years ago, for example, this new normal, let's get on with it, let's deal with this, this is how things work now. If I ask you that question, what comes to mind? I think the most important part is that I think that we have to be a lot more sophisticated and granular around how we do business in China. I think 10 years ago, it was a little bit where kind of winners take all, let's grow, let's get the scale, let's get distribution. Every single CEO mm. was trying to build more stores, get more channels, get more distribution out there, right? Get more customer acquisition. We spend money to cover the market because scale meant everything. Mm. I think right now there's a realization that we can't just go with that playbook. There needs to be something different. And that something different needs to be, hey, a lot more granular. Here's where this segment of people the problem needs to be this way. I need to be profitable while I grow at the same time, right? So a lot more things where I think the reality is just going to be tougher, harder, and unless we up our game, we will no longer be able to be a winner in this market. I think that's a realization. So how does that playbook look different compared to what kind of business you are too? Because you've got the SOEs, you've got the private sector, and then you've got foreign businesses as well. You know, I think that obviously from everyone, it has to do with where they start off with. But mm. I can tell you one thing. You know, the SOEs and the private businesses and the multinationals are competing in the same market. And the comp competitive ferocity in China, I think is second to none, right? I look at these price cuts happening in every single industry. I mm. look at how the product innovation has to come out every three months from most industries out there. I look at how competitive the market is and none of the SOEs, the private companies, or the multinationals are immune from that at all. I actually think that a lot of people think that, oh, you know, it must be very different. Are the SOEs in a much better position? I can tell you, in that market, everyone got to compete. And, you know, unless you get to the top and you're the best, 
um, I think there'll be a lot of um, there's a bloodbath going on right now in the uh, Chinese business economy. And do you do you think that's a symptom of overcapacity? I think the symptom of people have built a lot of capacity in expectation for a high growth that expected after COVID. So we are now dealing with you know the 2021, 20, 2022 expectations that have actually not been met in a more medium growth market. So the overcapacity, I think, is something where we talk a lot about it right now, but I think that it's something where in the past two years, there's been a lot less build out of capacity. So I think that in the next one or two years, this is going to get back into normal state. Right. But right now, obviously, at this minute, um, there is a lot of supply in many areas. And when you know, there's an oversupply, what happens is that pricing comes down. So in every single industry right now, pricing is the issue. And pricing comes down, margin gets squeezed, businesses are struggling. That's what we're seeing. How do you see that playing out for foreign businesses in particular? Because I think one of the key themes that's really emerging is just that preference for China-owned or China-homegrown companies in some sectors. You think about, for instance, this week was Apple uh, losing a lot of ground there. You've seen weakness in EVs like Tesla, for instance. How do you advise companies in China that are multinationals? You know, I think that there are multinationals in China that have done fantastic, right, mm. in the past two decades, and they still continue to make a lot of money, right? China, actually, for most large multinational consumer companies, are between 15 to 40 percent of the global market, okay? So I would say the first thing is that, you know, these global brands and the products have actually been very, very popular in China, okay? I would say that right now what's happening is that in every single category, from phones to cars to everything else, I think, as I said before, the com competition is really growing up. Competition comes from everywhere, right? Mm. The, the local Chinese company is seeing the same competition. They are also losing share too, right? So yeah. I think that right now it is a little bit where everyone's competing for a market that is just frankly going to be kind of medium growth, right? And so this, you know, I, I, I call it the next year of transition where we'll see who gets to be the winners at the end and who are the losers. I think there'll be a lot of losers here, mm. but there will be multinationals that will win big. And I, I'm seeing them every day, and they are still going very strong. Do you think the advice then is for big international firms to customise their products further? That was the recommendation coming through from Mark Ehrman, for instance, as our Apple reporter, saying that actually Apple needs to treat China as a distinct market. Yeah, I mean, a few years ago, we actually talked about the multinationals need to deal with China as its own local market, right? And how do you become this to be a whole market? Right. Look, I think, you know, Apple has been fan done fantastic in China. It's been one of the biggest markets globally, I think for a lot of companies as well. You know, I think for most multinationals, they already know in China, the product cycle is two times, three times as fast as what you have back at home. I think the Chinese consumer are a lot more experimental. They like to try new things. Mm. They are much more open-minded around trying new brands, mm. right? If you look at the EVs right now, yes, a few years ago it was Tesla, right? It was a few of the Chinese brands. But right, right now there is a whole host of new Chinese companies coming up with their new brands too. And they're switching from those old brands to the new brands, right? So whether you're multinational who have been the incumbent or even the Chinese private company mm. that's the incumbent or the Chinese SOE that's the incumbent, I think people are switching. So I think that it is the same for everyone in terms of the Chinese consumer who is really discerning, likes value for money, likes to switch, looking always to find the next good deal. And I think that we just have to, you know, accept that that is the market we're in. The switching costs seems to take on a different meaning in China, right? So you talked about Tesla. Bell and I were just talking yesterday. We had a guest talking about how, you know, what is Tesla's problem in China? Is it mm. pricing? And, you know, you... I guess you take a poll of the, the 100 newest models in China, they're probably all Chinese brands. And I'm wondering whether Ch American or multinational companies are putting too much emphasis on their brand value alone and they're not innovating as quickly. What, what's your take there? I definitely think that the innovation cycle in China is the fastest in the world. And mm -hmm. I think that for foreign companies, one of the ways to be, remain competitive and to keep up with you know, all this is to have their own cycle move a lot quicker, right, in China. I think that if you think about the multinational as a, I got a great product globally and just sell into China, mm. it may work for the first few years. Mm. But then when the locals are innovating at the pace that they're innovating, I think you got to catch up and, and, and keep that up. So I do think, you know, I was on the CEO recently, a multinational mm. one, and he said to me, 
that the reason why we're in China is because I want my company to learn the speed of innovation that's happening in China that will help me in my other markets right, mm. to get a bit of that. So I do think that there is something to what you're saying here in terms of this innovation pace and speed and, you know, and, and, uh, and agility right, that I think is, uh, is, is quite something that everyone needs to learn. Right. Uh, let's talk about your business. So overcapacity. Is McKinsey overcapacity in this part of the world? Are, you, are a lot of your people on the beach, as to, to use a parlance from your industry? Well, look, I think that right now the consulting industry in China is, is pretty flat, mm. right? I think that relative to the years before, mm. um, I think everyone in the industry is trying to make adjustments into how to get that supply and demand. Um, if you look at our own numbers and our own people, I think that you know, the number of people who are working on projects and working you know, on the beach, as you said, you know, I think those numbers track towards the, you know, the long-term average. Right? So we, like everyone else, need to navigate through this. Right? But I think that we're in good shape and we're doing good work, so we're quite positive about the long-term prospects here. But you talk about innovation and that innovation cycle being so much faster. How do you implement that into your own business? Oh, we have to move very quickly. If you mm. look at McKinsey in China now versus what we were four or five years ago, mm. I think we're doing many, many new things. Um, I think the way we work with clients, okay. I think needs to be different. Um, right now, we're working on a lot of things where we have to co-underwrite and co-share some of the outcomes. Mm. Um, you know, AI, data, um, digital. I think these are themes that China has moved so quickly that we had to also up our own skills and capabilities in order to keep up with, with that. So like everyone else and like the advice we give to our clients, hey, we got to move too. Otherwise, you know, we'll be sitting there and uh, we'll be irrelevant to the market. The, the priority of officials has really been just back to the, where we started the conversation. You know, reviving the economy, reviving confidence in markets, reviving the IPO market, boosting sentiment there. We know official, we've been told officials have reached out to the private banks and asked them, for example, for advice. Have they reached out to consultancies like yourself for informal advice on what to do? No, we haven't had, you know, that type of conversations, right? Mm. But what I'm very uh, glad to hear in mm. many public forums, right, like the China Development Forum mm. and, and others, is that the government is really putting a lot of emphasis around you know, uh, building confidence right, in both multinationals as right. well as local private companies, um, which has been two sectors where there really needs more confidence. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that hopefully we're reaching the bottom here and we'll see a little bit of that uptick. Uh, we see a little bit of that already, but that needs to come, uh, come sooner, hopefully. All right, Joe, thanks very much for your insights and your time this morning. That was Joe Nye there, Greater China Chairman and Senior Partner at McKinsey and & Company. And if you're a Bloomberg subscriber, of course, you can catch up with all of our interviews, including this one, by using our interactive function TV Go. You can also join the conversation by sending instant messages to our team and our guests during our live programming. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at some of the big movers so far in the session, Great Wall Motors really standing out to us after its earnings beat. Other ones in focus, New Oriental uh, profit missed their investors saying perhaps that's overdone. Sense time absolutely surging for a second straight session. New AI model in focus and Prada as well, one to watch. So much weakness we've seen the luxury names, but actually Prada looking a little bit stronger. There we go. And maybe because of Sense time and some of the other tech names, this is happening in the tech space. HS Tech Index up for a fourth day. Every single day this week. We're looking at 19 straight days of net inflows coming into Hong Kong via the Stock Connect, three tenths of one percent. We are currently, as things stand, on track for the best week since December 2022. This is The China Show. All right, welcome back to shows. It's boring in Tokyo today, but <laughs> trust me when I say that tomorrow will be another day. Bank of Japan, of course, on deck. Two-day policy meeting starts today. Dollar yen at 155.41, lowest level here, weakest level since June of 1990. Implied vol overnight, it's back to the highest level so far um, since December of last year. So uh, people are positioned for fireworks. Do we get some is another question altogether. Well, you said it's boring in, in Tokyo today, mm. but you know where it's not boring? Where? 
Beijing because we've got uh, Blinken, oh, yes. Secretary of State That's right. Anthony Blinken, uh, kicking off a visit mm. there to, to China and going to be meeting with a lot of different Chinese officials. Mm. But what we're hearing so far is that... Uh, He's raising concerns about China trade policies in the meeting, and we know overcapacity was a key issue going into this. Yeah. In fact, don't take our word for it. We were speaking with uh, the McKinsey boss for this part of the world, and because of the slowing economy and the planning that went through in 2021, mm. 2022, there is some oversupply, they say, in the Chinese economy, hence why you're seeing maybe uh, price pressures come through as well. Yep, that they have raised these concerns, as Bell was pointing out, in China trade policies there. Uh, in, well, in that meeting, of course, it's taking place. I guess the question is, do we see a meeting there between him and Xi Jinping, the Chinese yeah. president? There that's, we go. That's okay. the big question. All right. Uh, markets today, so we're just about 90 minutes into the session so far for mainland China, Hong Kong, and uh, the big gains that are coming across so far, which you can't actually see here, but Hong Kong, really, uh, the Hang Seng rising 1%. That's wow. against that backdrop you see yeah. here, because actually what that story tells us is the weakness that's feeding through, and, and the key sector that's really feeding into that so far is what you see for IT, uh, top left there you can see a drop of nearly two percent for that sub index it's the story of meta of course and we had those numbers coming out after the bell today a couple of things standing out in terms of their guidance and also their spending plans as well let's change up take a look at some of the stocks that are moving off the back of that again 10 cent it's a bit of a different story for china tech companies but a lot of the names in asia today are slumping pretty significantly the likes of rakuten there softbank as well in the red but let's get more on the meta earnings why investors are so unimpressed at this point in time, Ed Ludlow has more. Mark Zuckerberg outlined that Meta's put itself in a position to be the leading AI company in the world. And there is a commitment to spend on the infrastructure needed to support that, to build future generations of models on the back of the success of Llama 3. Uh, the problem is investors just aren't buying it. And, you know, the message that really hit them in the call was that it's going to take time for it to show up meaningfully on the top and bottom line. What we're talking about is Meta AI, the current generation of the, the assistant. They're trying to scale that. Smart investors, quote, would be able to see that even if revenue is not immediately obvious from AI, you can see that AI products like Meta AI, the assistant, scaling, and you can see the monetizable opportunity. But Meta's business is still mostly advertising. You know, they're seeing impressions growth. They're seeing uh, the average ad price or ad price growth go up as well. And in some cases, you could argue that's where AI is showing its value. Meta's kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't. There have been segments of the market calling for some time, hey, spend more on AI infrastructure, get going on this. And then there are those that want to see the prudence. So that's the message uh, from Zuckerberg. Be patient. Trust us. It's going to cost us billions of dollars to get there, but we will get there. When does this largely advertising-based business see serious top-line growth from AI? Um, Apparently, it's coming. Uh, whether investors believe it, well, we, we'll find out in the markets. This is Ed Ludlow for Bloomberg News in San Francisco. Yeah, certainly this AI theme that's uh, really piercing its way through uh, markets today. SK Hynix, along those notes, uh, along that note here, really good set of earnings. Similar price action to what we're seeing in Meta, down 3.8% over in South Korea. Expecting this full recovery, though, as it pertains to the memory chip market. AI, speaking of demand there, powering uh, the company to its fastest revenue growth since at least 2010. Peter Elstrom is with us right now, executive editor for Asia Tech. Uh, Peter, good set of earnings, bad reaction in markets. Let's focus in on the business, though. Yeah, let's break it down a little bit. Uh, this is actually a good complement to the meta story. You heard Mark Zuckerberg talk about how they're going to make these investments in AI. A lot of the uh, gear that they're going to get is going to require semiconductors from companies like NVIDIA and Hynix in particular. What we heard from Hynix today is that they see the memory chip market recovering very strongly. Uh, it's been in a bit of a lull over the past couple of, of years, and they saw revenue increase more than 100%, uh, so very explosive growth. I think the caveat there is that that was from a pretty low base. A year ago, they had a relatively low revenue. They lost money, and this year we saw a, a strong growth, more than 100% growth, plus they returned to profitability. They also did say that they're going to invest a huge amount of money into chip capacity in the future. They're going to spend more than $15 billion in Korea to try to build 
more uh, fabs to be able to build these uh, AI chips, AI memory chips that complement the NVIDIA chips and then are sold to companies like Meta and Google and OpenAI, et cetera, et cetera. So that investment was a very large amount of money that comes on top of about $4 billion that they plan on spending in the U.S. for advanced uh, chip packaging there that's part of the U.S. effort to try to rebuild its chip industry. So these are very aggressive investments and I think what investors saw is that with that amount of money going into capacity across the board, that's it's going to cost Hynix in the short term. Their goal is to be able to build profitability, of course, for the long term. And do you think then, given that CapEx that's come through, is it something that's going to allow them to stay ahead of the likes of Samsung, for instance, mm. in that key HBM market? Yeah, that's a very important uh, market. The memory chip market is extremely competitive. Samsung historically has been the leader in that market. They're the biggest. Uh, they also have competition from uh, Micron in the U.S. Hynix has been able to jump out to a lead in these AI memory chips, HBM uh, memory chips. They've been quite successful in partnering with NVIDIA in particular, pairing those with NVIDIA's products to be able to sell to them to the big customers that we talked about, like OpenAI, that's been very successful for ChatGPT. And the executives at Hynix in the conference call today talked about the great opportunities there. They think that that HBM market is going to grow about 60% a year, so very, very strong growth. They think that's going to help them quite a bit. The key question is whether their competitors are going to be able to catch up. Samsung has tons of resources to be able to pour into this market right now. They've targeted HBM. They do not like being behind Hynix, particularly their hometown competitor. So they're planning on investing very aggressively and giving some more competition to the HBM market. So it still may continue continue to grow, the real question for investors and for these companies is whether margins are going to be able to uh, hold up given that additional competition. There's probably going to be some additional price competition as the market grows if Samsung is able to come out with some competitive products. Peter, thank you. Peter Elstrom on the SK Hynix story and the broader AI story there as well. More on this, in fact, right now. So Lenovo has put out uh, their latest CIO reports. Um, and when you look at some of the findings and on your screens right now, right, so effectively you're looking at uh, AI, in fact, now matching cybersecurity as one of the most urgent IT-related issues um, out there right now. Now, the study also found that most companies are simply not ready, uh, hampering their ability to rapidly scale, in fact, their capabilities as far as this is concerned. Joining us now to talk us through this is Lenovo Solutions and Services Group President Ken Wong. Ken, it's nice to see you. I had the report in your hands. We just mentioned that people know and recognize the need to do this, but also companies are not ready. What does that mean, companies are not ready? Well, hi, good morning, uh, David Annabelle. Thanks for having me here. Uh, we just, as you said, we just released our uh, uh, global study of uh, CIO uh, for the new fiscal year. And the, uh, some of the insights are really fascinating and insightful, right? Say, for example, in a nutshell, I think, you know, the, the CIO are inside the tornado now. Hmm. because there's a lot of promises that AI is talking about how can they benefit the business hmm. but there are the CIO report is clearly showing that there's a lot of obstacles that the organization needs to overcome and this is beyond technology let me double click a couple of insights right so say for example you know most of CIO sees the speed of implementation and also the you know you know the lack of a corporate right wide policy uh, with regard to AI are some of the big challenges, right? Mm. So the the key thing is you know technology is one important pillar, but there are broader uh, things that we need to consider in order to you know deploy AI in an organization uh, and you know see the results. So lack of uh, adoption or widespread adoption, lack of policies as well, some of the key issues. Does that sort of signal there's perhaps an education gap as well? Well, our, our view is there are a few things, right? So it, indeed, there are four things that we need to consider. Mm. Number one is for whoever, regardless of individual or corporation, when they deploy AI solution, security is the number one issue. Number one thing that we need to consider. Second is people, because in our view, you know, AI is not going to re replace human being. It's going to augment human being. So there's another thing that we need to consider is how can we uh, up skills and, and train the organization in order to help them to unleash the full power of AI. 
And the last but not least is about the processes, right? Because with the deployment of AI, there's a lot of processes need to be renewed in order to, you know, uh, uh, unleash the full power of AI. So there are four pillars from security, people, processes, and of course technology that we need to consider. Right. One of the things that also stood out to me, you mentioned it already briefly, is the, the, the challenge of justifying the investment. Mm. Right? Return on the ROI on doing this, it, it's very difficult because it's new in two, three years in a row. How much of that is a problem? Right? And, and should we look at this as an investment too, or a necessary expense? Because then you don't look for a, a future cash flow. Well, on for the latter. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. So if we look at uh, the study of our CIO, this is one of the top five problems that you know we hear from our CIOs. Mm. That's why I think in Lenovo, our approach is to look at a broader perspective, not just technology, mm. right? To see how can we how can we help the, our customer to discover, you know, the readiness of AI. Mm. Which part of AI, which part of the organization is more ready for deploying AI? And then how can we, how can we calculate the return on investment? Because at the end of the day, right, our CIO and CXO need to you know, build a business case and justify the, the, the investment. Mm. Now, if you look at Asia, right, because we're sitting in Hong Kong, we, we see you know, different uh, uh, kind of insight from different parts of Asia. For example, we see uh, you know, the CIO from India you know, they already seen, uh, you know, a better return on AI investment. Now, for example, in Singapore, right, you know, there's a unanimous, almost 100% of the CIO that we survey is going to double down in terms of AI investment. Now, the last example I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share is, for example, in China, the CIO in China are seeing more return of deploying AI solution with regard to achieving their overall sustainability goal, right? So obviously, in terms of uh, return on investment, there's, a, there's a something that we need to and we have to do with our customer to realize the, uh, to, to come up with the ROI. And there are different requirements and different maturity in different parts, at least in different parts of Asia, right. uh, that we can help. What's interesting as well from the survey, you found that 96%, so nearly 100% of CIOs are, are committed to spending more on AI over the coming years, but only 20% expect their overall IT budgets to grow by more than 10%. So <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. what misses out here? Yeah, yeah square that circle for us. Well, I think the number, one, the number one thing insight is that, you know, would, would there be some shift, right, from left to the right or right to the left? Right, but indeed, if we look at AI, this is this is across you know across department, across industry, right? So in our perspective, you know AI is going to benefit you know all use cases. Now that said, I think in our, in, in our experience, even when we deploy internally AI solution for Lenovo, right, which is a, a huge organization, the complex of operation, there are a few use cases that are more ready and proven than the others. For example, services test support, right? Service test support for a bank, service support for your know, my organization. Mm. This is more ready. On average, we see at least 15 to 20 percent efficiency gain on a help desk uh, with the AI deployment. The other thing that we see a more mature use case is about software development, mm. right? On average, again, about 15 to 20 percent of efficiency gain in software development. Right. So how good is that? You know, even my organization, because I also run the IT for the company, and this is why this is where we can learn the experience, the tool that we develop, not just for Lenovo, but it's proven for Lenovo as well as our, our customer, and that's why we can help. People tend to be averse to things they don't f fully understand, and I'm wondering. Anecdotally, you know, I had the conversation a few weeks back with somebody. And we were talking about this topic, and one of the things they brought up was, well, our company, our internal policies are uh, not as updated to embrace the new technology. And I'm wondering how, how much of the education that Annabelle brought up and you know, the need for corporates to look at their internal policies and be open to this new technology, how much of that is a challenge right now? Well, it's, it's, you know, based on our CIO uh, study mm -hmm. and our interaction with our customer, this is you know, one of the big... Uh, thing that our customer is facing and hence Lenovo can come and, and help. Mm. Right? For, like for example, everyone is talking about AI. As I said, security is the number one thing to consider. Second is how can we deploy AI responsibly? Right? Is there any bias and hallucination that we need to take care? Mm. Right? So that we can deploy 
uh, AI for a company responsibly. Now, as I said, the thing that I want to emphasize, this is beyond a technology discussion, right? This is a broader uh, discussion among security, data, process, and technology. And that's why I think uh, starting from last year, we have established a new AI practice which is including advisory and also implementation and managed part mm -hmm. of the AI solution so that we can help our customer to approach the AI solution deployment holistically and at the end of the day, realize the full power of AI for you know, companies and our customers. I, I, w w w one last follow very quickly, if, if you could. You mentioned data security is a big issue. Are companies tending to find AI solutions with companies that are aligning geopolitically, for example. Chinese companies looking at Chinese solutions. American companies looking at American solutions, hmm. as an example. Well, I think the, 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 one of the, the, one of the things that we learned, because we also have uh, global operation, we operate in 180 markets. Hmm. The number one requirement from our customer is how can they comply to the law and regulation of the, ju of the different jurisdiction across the world. Right. And this is something that Lenovo has a lot of experience and also technology that can help our customers. Ken, a pleasure to have you on the show. Fantastic report. Thank you so much. Hi, to your team. Ken Wong there, Lenovo Solutions and Services Group President. Right, just ahead, uh, we're taking straight back to the Beijing Auto Show. First time in the capital, Chinese capital, uh, since, uh, well, in a couple of years. So more on what's happening there. This is Bloomberg. Well, the Beijing Auto Show is underway in the Chinese capital and our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, is at the venue and joins us now. And Steve, you've had a lot of great interviews, uh, great interviews coming up, but, but also this is a huge exhibition. So tell us what's the sentiment like on the ground. Yeah, I mean, there are more people, obviously, than cars here. There are cars back behind me. Trust me, you just can't see them because there's so many people. We are jammed in here like uh, subcompact sardines. Uh, but it's uh, obviously the first day of the uh, Beijing Auto Show, which has not been back here in some five years in 2019 in earnest. So a lot has changed in the EV space, no doubt, in those five years. The top 10 leaderboard is dominated, absolutely dominated, uh, for the EV space by Chinese makers, nine of the top 10. Uh, in the first quarter in sales are Chinese makers uh, led by BYD. They have six of the top ten spots uh, of the models that are sold here in China. And a lot of them are in the affordable range, including two that are below 11,000 U.S. dollars. So there's also, that's the number one theme, really, the Chinese makers rolling out lots of models, really dominating. What does that mean for the legacy players, the foreigners, like the Volkswagens, like the Mercedes, the BMWs, the Fords, the Chevrolet. These guys really dominated in this market in the previous decades with their internal combustion engines. VW have been here more than 40 years, but right now in the EV space, they're number 10. They have maybe 2%. So they brought their investor day here. They brought their executives here. They're having a number of different partnerships. BMW also launching a number of different models here. Mercedes here in force. They're trying to see if, they're, if they've lost the local market because, again, it's so dominated by EVs and not necessarily the internal combustion engine. So what are going to be the models being rolled out by the foreign legacy players? The number two main theme, exports. Obviously, the Chinese have huge ambitions to take their models abroad. We talked to uh, you know, Great Wall Motor earlier this morning. They have big ambitions and are selling abroad. But of course, with the export story comes the story of protectionism, potential terror and overcapacity and potential allegations of dumping by the Chinese. They need to get that uh, excess capacity sold somewhere. Prices are coming down domestically because there's a price war. Prices are, might go up overseas if there's going to be some tariffs in Europe and elsewhere. Steve, as you, as you walk around there, have you seen anything cool? <laughs> There's so many cool things at auto shows. I love cars, obviously. I'm a guy. Love cars. Uh, girls love cars, too. I know that. But the SU7 from Xiaomi is the interesting one. And we have some video of that. Lei Jun, the chairman of the phone maker, Xiaomi, really kind of giving an update on the launch of their first EV, uh, Porsche-like, uh, really kind of a higher-end uh, 
EV, luxury EV, that Lei Jun says they've already had orders of about 75,000, and they've delivered more than 5,000 since they launched in March. And the, the wow factor of this is seeing the tech companies in China go into the automobile and EV space, the so-called smart EV space, and all the telematics that are going to go into the car and the connectivity. So Xiaomi's in the game, uh, and also Huawei, right over here. They're going to be having some announcements coming up at 11.30 local time. They don't have a car themselves, but they have partnership. So it's Huawei inside a number of different cars. So while, uh, you know, Apple has gotten out of the potential EV space, Chinese phone makers are going full head on. Steve, all right, have fun. Stephen Engel, of course, lots of good conversations coming up there at the Beijing Auto Show with Steve and, and the team. Uh, plenty more ahead. This is, this is Bloomberg. Here's your China brief, a look at what's making headlines in national newspapers. And the People's Daily has a commentary by China's financial watchdog on how the regulator will maintain strict supervision of risks. The piece also says policy should not be tightened or eased too quickly. Meanwhile, the Economic Daily is calling on regulators to improve the supervision and monitoring of illegal short-term trading. The article also calls for harsher punishment for such behaviour, including bans from participating in markets. And the PBOC-backed newspaper Financial News says local governments are set to accelerate the issuance of special bonds. It says this will happen over, this will happen over the next few quarters and will help drive China's economic recovery, Dave. Yeah, there you go. That's the fiscal push. Maybe at lower borrowing costs, looking at how low yields are, effectively CGB market, local currency bonds... Even your offshore uh, has certainly come down. Right. Uh, brief look at equity markets, and we're coming up lows in the benchmark, 7 tenths of 1%. A lot of this, if not all of this, has to do with the rebound we're seeing today in Hong Kong. This is The China Show.